Good evening and welcome to Ask the Chief. I'm Naiva Reynoso. In the last few months, we've all heard the stories and seen the images of alleged police brutality in cities across the country. The headlines continue to come out of Ferguson, Missouri and New York, and most recently close to home in Venice. So what does this mean for our city of Santa Monica? Tonight, we're gonna ask questions and have a real discussion on the role of policing in our community. Joining me now is Santa Monica's Chief of Police, Jacqueline Seabrooks. Thanks for being here, Chief. Well, thank you for having me. And for all you viewers at home, you'll get a chance to speak with the Chief as well. Later in the show, we'll be taking calls and you can tweet your questions using hashtag AskTheChief. So Chief Seabrooks, how have the recent events impacted the city of Santa Monica? Well, looking at what's happening on a national stage, um, one has to translate them very differently mm -hmm. uh, for here in Santa Monica. Um, right. We're a community that um, is very diverse, that looks to embracing the gover governmental structure, but at the same time certainly asks questions about the things that uh, we see as it relates to policing services. So what that means for me and for the men and women of the Santa Monica Police Department is that we have to spend some time talking about uh, how we go about uh, policing in the community, how we go about uh, nurturing the partnerships that we have, uh, we've developed and that we're looking to develop, how we go about nurturing those partnerships, um, how we are bridging the gap between expectation and performance, things like that, and then how we address those, uh, area, those issues that sometimes occur when things just don't seem to go the way one might expect them to go. Right. We've also seen the images, you know, on media about the militarization of police. We've mm -hmm. seen police in riot gear, armored vehicles. What's the Santa Monica Police Department's stance on the militarization of police? Well, I think one has to understand exactly what militarization means. Mm -hmm. um, policing is a, mil a paramilitary um, structure by design. Mm -hmm. It's how we uh, take charge of lots of people, getting them doing unified things. Right. I think what concerned our, our, the public mm -hmm. was when they looked at what happened in Ferguson and they saw these track style vehicles, we saw uh, folks with, with uh, semi-automatic uh, weaponry, we saw uniforms that looked a lot like the military, and we saw this um, just on our city streets. Right. Uh, but I think the challenge uh, that for law enforcement is to be sure that while we have the proper equipment, mm -hmm. that we need to do the job, and, and let's make no mistake, uh, there's a lot of times when we do need to have uh, equipment that seems to be uh, more s substantial than what you would just see when you see an officer driving up and down the street in a black and white car and the equipment that goes with that. Right. The key though is the appropriate deployment mm -hmm. of that equipment. So I don't think that you know folks are, are concerned about the police department's need to have high-powered weapons. I mean going back to the bank robbery in North Hollywood uh, one can say, okay, we can see how policing has changed. The landscape of what police officers uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis has changed. But the key is, again, understanding the appropriate deployment of that equipment, understanding the community dynamic, understanding the situation that would warrant the application of that equipment. Right. Um, and then I think the federal government very recently has changed how we're going to deploy that type of equipment. Right. And when I say that, very recently, uh, the 1033 program, which is the government program whereby many local uh, police agencies and sheriff's departments acquired the equipment, that's been changed by order of the president and the Justice Department. So for those agencies that were receiving those items, fewer and fewer agencies will be receiving those items than has occurred in the past. Right. And what about dash cams or body cameras? Uh, a lot of policemen use them across the country. Does Santa Monica Police Department use that equipment? And if they do, tell us you know, in what way it, it helps or, or possibly hurts. Okay, well, Santa Monica Police Department does use in-car camera or dash cam mm -hmm. as, as it's commonly referred to. Um, we believe that that uh, equipment provides us with additional insights mm -hmm. about things that are going on, potential training opportunities for our staff. And certainly it serves to record aspects of things that occur that might slip past the naked eye. On the other hand, we do not use body cams at this point, but we're evaluating the feasibility of implementing a um, pilot program where we'll be looking at various uh, technological platforms uh, to incorporate into our toolbox, if you will. 
Right. Also, racial profiling has been a hot topic lately. Tell us about uh, how that comes into play as far as the Santa Monica Police Department. Well, the Santa Monica Police Department, like most uh, police agencies in the, in the state of California at the very least, uh, abide by the California Penal Code, which requires that we provide training to our police employees on uh, the uh, circumstances associated with bias, implicit bias and certainly explicit bias. Mm -hmm. And that when our workforce is trained properly, they understand that we are all subject to degrees of bias and it's our job as a police department to be objective all the time and base our actions on behavior. And then we have a policy uh, which prohibits uh, racial profiling or bias-based policing, as it's more formally called, and there's penalties for violating those policies, and we make sure that our staff adheres to that. If someone believes that they've been a victim of racial profiling, mm -hmm. what's the protocol? How do they file a complaint? Okay, well, the first thing I say is, let the feel situation that gives rise to that concern, let that situation resolve, mm -hmm. and then go home, write some things down and the next day or if it's appropriate even that same day contact the Santa Monica Police Department or the police department uh, that is policing the jurisdiction where the traffic stopped, the vehicle stopped, the contact where that occurred and right. ask to speak to a supervisor. That, when In speaking to that supervisor what you get is the opportunity to uh, state your case, mm -hmm. express your concerns and be heard. Right. And then the supervisor can take that information, provide insights that may be lacking. Because sometimes the first response that someone has is, well, the only reason the officer stopped me or did this is because I am fill in the blank. Right. And 99 times out of 100, generally speaking, uh, the circumstance is no, the officer did not know that you were fill in the blank. The officer reacted because of this set of objective circumstances. Right. So it gives the opportunity for the give and take. If a complaint is warranted, a complaint will be taken and it will be thoroughly investigated. And when I say that, I say that as it relates to how we operate at the Santa Monica Police Department. But I also say as a person, it's not appropriate to take the argument in the street, to mm -hmm. make that argument, because at points in time, you know, I'd like to say that all police officers everywhere are calm, cool, and collected. We know sometimes that's not the case. Right. Talk to us about the demographics of our community and how that compares to the demographics of the police department in Santa Monica. Okay. Well, a lot of con conversation about police department demographics mm -hmm. has uh, spawned forth from what occurred in Ferguson. Right. Um, and I like to say that Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Police Department is not reflective of its community. Quite frankly, we are far more reflective than our community's demographic. Um, you know, largely speaking, uh, this community is um, primarily Caucasian, and our police department, while that majority is still there, the reality is our percentages are much more broadly distributed. Mm -hmm. And I just happen to have some statistical data oh. here that I can share that will help to um, put some clarity uh, in terms of what that means. So, for example, our community is 70% um, Caucasian, um, and in the city of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, it's 29%. However, our police department, in terms of our, uh, police, d our police officers, is 49% Caucasian. Wow. However, when you look at uh, the total, it's 33% Hispanic, 12% black, and 5% um, other, or excuse me, Asian. And then 2% um, is other. So when you look at that in comparison with this, the city, mm -hmm. we have 70% um, Caucasian to 49%. Um, it's 4% black as the city, but our police department is 12%. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, community is 13% Hispanic, but our police department is 33%. Um, our city is 9% Asian, and in our organization, we are 5%, and then it's 4% other for the city, um, and I, I misspoke, it's 1% in the organization. Right. So when one looks at that, we're a city of about 90,000 people, but our police department is roughly on the sworn side of the house about 209 police officers. Right. And this is a great kind of uh, sample that maybe other police departments may want to look at and, and possibly study because it is also, you know, it, it makes your department more culturally sensitive, yes. especially because Santa Monica, there's so many tourists that yes. come from all over the country. Yes. We're gonna throw to a break right now. Thank you so much for all this wonderful information. <laughs> if you guys want to ask the chief a question, well, coming up after the break, you can call 310-458-4950. We'll be right back with more 
from Chief Seabrook. So make sure to call 310-458-4950. If you have any questions or if you're shy and don't want to call, you can tweet your questions using hashtag AskTheChief. You're watching City TV Santa Monica. We'll be right back. Thank you. Slow down. Right next to the library on 7th Street is the Santa Monica History Museum, where history comes to life yeah. for the entire family. <sighs> Enjoy the exhibits, main gallery, the photo archive, research gallery, and much more. Come visit the Santa Monica History Museum, keeping history alive. Experience Highway's Performance Space and Gallery. I knew my journey would lead me to a place. Where I'd find a highway that I could travel to the beat of my own drum. Right out the storm, 95 Joey died, but Deadly was born. And there would be no limits to the vibrancy of my performance. Join us each week at Highway's Performance Space and Gallery and live without limits. Log on to highwaysperformance.org. Care packages give hope while you're away fighting battles. But what happens when battles follow you home? JVS Veterans First helps returning soldiers transition to civilian life with services such as peer support, career counseling, and job training. JVS Veterans First can help. Own your honor. Visit JVSLA.org for more information. Discover 30 years of opera in Santa Monica. Discover the Verdi Chorus. We're back with Santa Monica Police Chief Jacqueline Seabrooks. We're on the air live tonight, and we're taking your calls and questions for the chief at 310-458-4950. What a great opportunity to ask the chief yourself all of your questions, 310-458-4950, or you can tweet your questions using hashtag Ask the Chief. So Chief Seabrooks, I wanted to know, how did the Santa Monica Police Department get so diverse? Because that's really unique. Well, it wasn't by accident that we became so diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came on the organization in 1982, uh, we were a fairly homogenous uh, police organization. But I think that uh, the chief then, uh, Chief James Keene, and later continued by then Chief uh, James Butts, I think that they recognized the value in uh, diversity within the organization, particularly given the fact that, as you referenced before, we're heavily uh, tourist-driven. Um, and I think, you know, not just tourists, but people from all over Los Angeles County. Right. So I think that, you know, having a, a, an organization uh, that has strategically recruited to be sure that it is reflective, not just of this community, but the larger community we serve, because we serve uh, a collective of people that exceed what is located right in this geographic footprint. Right. Um, I think it was done by design. Um, we strategically focused our recruitment on women, on people of color, and as uh, individuals representing those groups, myself included, moved through the ranks and assumed leadership positions, we kept that going and we made sure that we um, focused our attention on ensuring that folks who might ordinarily have been excluded under previous times when law enforcement was less welcoming, that they were welcome in our organization and had equal opportunities to compete for positions doing different things. And that makes the workplace an attractive place for people who are seeking uh, a career in law enforcement. Right. And truth be told, who wouldn't want to work in Santa Monica, <laughs> right? That's what I say. <laughs> so we have a caller, Sarah. You have a question for the chief. I do. Hi, Chief Seabrooks. How are you? Hi, Sarah. How are you? Thanks for calling. Thank you. So I'm very excited about the expo coming into town, but basically it's going to cut right down the middle of Santa Monica. So how is that going to affect police response time? 
Well, we're working very closely with our ally partners to be sure that we minimize any adverse impacts that rail presents as it crosses through town. Uh, we're working closely with the fire department, other city departments, uh, the local hospitals, and we're also doing some things very uniquely with our deployments to make sure that the way that we staff the city from a police perspective ensures that response times are maintained, low response times. All right, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Another issue that Santa Monica has is that it's very close to a major city, the city of Los Angeles. So how does that affect Santa Monica policing-wise? Well, the first thing we have to do is let folks who come to Santa Monica know when they've come into Santa Monica. And our signage says that. Our uniforms are distinctly different from the city of Los Angeles in that we wear shoulder patches that say, Watch this, Santa Monica. <laughs> um, but on the whole though, it also presents some unique challenges because you know, as people go about their business, they don't make those distinctions. Uh, they don't necessarily equate a different experience. And it's the city's obligation, our collective obligation, to ensure that the experience to s in Santa Monica is one that's unique, it's memorable, and that'll get people coming back here again. Right, and speaking of that, how is policing in Santa Monica unique as far as our city's geography? Well, our geography, differently than uh, a lot of the cities that are around us, and certainly Los Angeles, we're eight square miles or a little mm -hmm. bit more, um, so we can give a personalized touch to our law enforcement. And by that I mean you get to know who the officers are who work in your area, you get to see them very frequently. We have shows like this uh, that showcase the wonderful work of the men and women of the Santa City of Santa Monica's Police Department. We can talk about the safe environment that we strive to maintain, and then we can talk about those, those challenges and opportunities and, and growth moments that occur for both the police department and the community as we are part of this community's fabric. Right. So when someone comes into the city of Santa Monica is enjoying a night, you know, uh, walking through downtown or mm -hmm. et cetera, and a police approaches them and asks them for ID f for their identification for whatever reason, what's What's the protocol? What should a, a, a police officer, what are they allowed to ask for? And what should the person, how should the person behave when approached by a police officer uh, for their identification? Okay, well, that's a multi-layered question. And the answer um, is also multi-layered. Mm -hmm. um, officers don't just randomly walk up to folks and say, give me your identification. Right. Usually there is a bona fide reason for that initiation of contact. Mm -hmm. um, so typically the, the contact goes something like this. Uh, hi, I'm Officer So-and-So from the Santa Monica Police Department. You did A, B, and C. Right. Do you mind if I have some identification? Um, and, the, and, and the reason for the explaining of the you did A, B, and C is so that we are clear, everyone, the two parties are clear, this is not uh, just a, 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 a what we call a consensual encounter, it's a detention. Right. And this detention has with it uh, a reasonable suspicion that cr criminal activity, even though minor in nature when you're talking about maybe jaywalking or something like that, has right. occurred. Because even though you know we don't equate jaywalking and bank robbery, certainly, the reality of the situation is we have the vehicle code and, and jaywalking is contained within that, and we have an obligation to enforce for that. Now, we also have what's called a, a, a casual encounter. Now, that's where I come up and I just say, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. And you can look at me and say, kick rocks. Uh, and if you say that, Okay, I have no choice but to kick rocks. In the absence of any other activities that would enable me to ask you for identification. Right. But as a general rule, when officers approach an individual and ask for identification, they're asking because something has occurred and the officer has a right to inquire about what has occurred and he or she wants to know with whom the officer is speaking. So what is the person required to, uh, to give the officer? Well, if it's, it's like this. If the person has identification, then it's appropriate to provide that identification in the form of a driver's license, in the form of uh, an identification card, stated is issued identification card, in the form of a passport. If mm -hmm. the person doesn't have it, then tell the officer your name, uh, provide the, there'll be a few more questions, you know, what's your birthday, but you know, the same kind of information that one would find on the identification, provide that. Right. Now, failing to do that, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have it, you know, you might want to say, I don't want to show it. Well, there's not an obligation legally that you provide it. The challenge will be if you are being investigated for some form of behavior, the officer does have a reasonable expectation that you'll provide that information that will facilitate the flow of the business 
meaning the reason for the stop. Right. So in, in the case where the, the identification is not readily provided, we may have to use the computer, we may have to use other means, we may even have to uh, initiate a visit to the station so that what we can do is verify your identification. And, and clearly the rules if you're driving a car are a bit different. This is just that one-on-one -on -one contact that might happen in the street. Okay. We have a caller, Michael. Okay. He wants to talk about homelessness in Santa Monica. Michael? Yeah. Yes, hello. Hi, Hi, Michael. What's your question? So my question is, how is the police department addressing the homeless issue in our city? What services do you offer? Okay, well, homelessness is addressed on several levels within our community because we have to remember one thing. Homelessness in and of itself is not a crime. Uh, now, there are behaviors that may spring forth from homelessness uh, that we find uh, problematic and the police department will enforce as to those activities. But more importantly, we have an array of social services that are provided through various nonprofits and by virtue of operation of several city departments. And the idea of these, these uh, resources is to ensure that there's a bridge for people who need services so that they can move from living in the street to living in a residence, but at the same time, if there's mental health issues, if there's substance abuse issues, the, the people can get the assistance that they need to help them begin to resolve those issues. Mm -hmm. And then we provide services. Sometimes, you know, people are traveling. They come from other places in the state, uh, in the country, uh, sometimes in the world, and they want to go back and reconnect with family. We have resources available uh, to those individuals to help them to make that reconnection. But if the, if the time period has been lengthy, we don't just send people home. We help them to make contacts and to be sure that there's someone on the receiving end who can uh, welcome them, make sure that they have the appropriate resources on that end that they need before we just send them back, w you know, resourceless and transfer the problem elsewhere. So there's an array of services uh, for people who have uh, me medical needs, mental health needs, um, home, you know, need for housing clearly, all of those different things, substance abuse, you name it. There's an array of resources out there for folks who have served in the military, for who have not, uh, so that we can help them to transition into residential living. Right. Thank you. And most of that is not something that's done by the police department, but we certainly can facilitate it because we're usually the first response in terms of those kinds of situations. Right. And here in the city of Santa Monica, I've seen a lot of police engagement with the community. There's uh, coffee with the cop, I love that name, <laughs> pizza with the cop. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about these activities and why they're so important for the department and for the community. Well, it's important for a police department to know its community and it's important for a community to know its police department mm -hmm. because I think those relationships go a long way in fostering trust, in, right. in uh, increasing perceptions of legitimacy of, of the police department, in creating that operational space that's necessary so that if something should go differently than what's expected, people aren't quick to because of a history or a legacy of, of feeling marginalized by the police, they aren't quick to uh, believe the worst possible. And instead, they'll, they'll reserve judgment, allow processes to occur, engage in dialogue, because it's very easy to be distrustful of somebody that you don't know. Uh, someone who just comes in, you have no relationship with them. But it's a little bit more difficult to do that when you have a long-standing relationship, when you see people, when you've had an opportunity to chat over a slice of pizza, a cup of coffee, um, where differences can be discussed, not when people are uh, in the heat of emotion, but are in the cool and calm of just a conversation. Right. And how does that fall as far as priority in your department? <laughs> it's, it's a huge <laughs> priority. Um, I always say, you know, you can the time to start learning who people are and having them learn who you are is not in the middle of a catastrophe, but it's in the middle of calm. Mm -hmm. uh, because that way, you know, people really come to the table, not because they're forced to, but because they want to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful that the men and women of the police department understand and recognize and embrace uh, this, this, part, this p notion that they need to be part of the community. I mean, it, it goes back to Robert Peel uh, when he talked about the police are the community and the community are the police. It's all one. Uh, that was true when he said it many, many, many years ago, and it's true today. Right. So tell me about the Police Activity League, or PAL. Okay. Well, PAL is another one of those opportunities for us to touch the future of our community through um, uh, interactions with our young people. Uh, it's a um, primarily a series of after-school programs that are consolidated 
uh, in one area with the idea that police officers can serve as mentors uh, for our young people. Uh, it's an opportunity for our young people in the community to have educational and academic counseling, to receive scholarships, and to have these kinds of experiences that are so crucial uh, for them to develop into, um, I don't want to say decent people, but decent people. Mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up in Los Angeles, um, South Central to be exact, or what they call SOLA now, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was growing up there, the, rea the relationships with the police were very strained. Um, and so it's one of those things where the opportunities that came to see something different came by operation of the way the school district worked. Well, these are different times. So in order to be sure that we're working positively, this is an opportunity for us to work with young people, for young people to interact with us in a way where the experiences that we both take away will change us for life. And how do young, young people get involved with PAL? Just show up. <laughs> Information on the website. Information right. on the website, they can call the Police Activities League. It's mm -hmm. located at 14th and Olympic. It's a free service to Santa Monica residents. Um, after school programming, tutoring, uh, field trips, LA Marathon through Students Run LA, all kinds of really neat uh, experiential programming. And things that you would find unique like uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil type activities, boxing, wow. karate. There's a lot of stuff going on at PAL. It's a great place. Wow. And so tell us about the police acad academy and what the experience is like for young recruits. Oh, it's horrifying. <laughs> 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 no, I say, I, I, I say that it's, it's, it's um, a cogent part of our um, developmental experience as new police officers. Everyone who is hired uh, as a police officer in the state of California goes through a police academy. Uh, the Santa Monica Police Department primarily utilizes the Orange County Sheriff's Academy, which is a six month long training program that provides the basics. And when I say basics, I mean the basics of uh, understanding of what it takes to, to be effective as a police officer. Uh, it instills discipline, um, it instills um, a sense of understanding about the basics of the law because after that training phase uh, police recruits return to the police department and they go through another six months of very structured training uh, less emphasis on the physical training the drill and some of the things that are necessary uh, now they come in and they're learning the nuances on the job wow. um, and so and then quite frankly the training never stops after that it's just a little bit differently cast right. so here I am 34 years later and I'm still learning something new every day wow. So tell us about how difficult it really is to become a police officer because you know you have the police academy and then it kind of starts dwindling until mm -hmm. until you finally become the police officer but it's not that it's not that easy. No. Well, you know, they always say if it, if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, right. But it's, it's, it's an excellent career choice. Mm -hmm. And yes, we start off with, let's just say for the sake of discussion, 100 candidates. Uh, by the time we do the written exam, the first interview phase, uh, the, next in the secondary interview phase, the background investigation, the psychological screening, the medical screening, the polygraph, uh, the chief's interview, the police academy, we may have a year later three people. Oh wow! Um, so it really is very intensive, uh, mm -hmm. but we want the best of the brightest out there uh, because the stakes are very, very heavy. I mean, we we all looked in horror at things that we've seen on our televisions that are, have been broadcast or have been commented on uh, in recent months, and that's why that process has to be so pinpoint accurate. And it, and it excludes, not because the people it excludes are not necessarily um, solid citizens and they won't necessarily make good police officers, but each police agency has its own tempo. It has its own expectation of what will work in the community. So here in Santa Monica, we tend to be far more selective. Our police officers uh, generally come to the table with at least uh, a two-year degree, but more often than not, a four-year or six-year degree. Mm -hmm. uh, some are mid-career uh, professionals who have always wanted to be a police officer, and they're coming to us at this stage in life. We rarely hire folks who are you know, in their early 20s, 21, 2021. We typically uh, hire uh, and skew toward a more mature candidate. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that pays dividends in the long run when juxtaposed against you know, what could potentially be the array of troubles. Right. So we are very selective and we do that on purpose as well. So is there an age cutoff? Because you mentioned that a lot of people th that want to go into the police academy are, are changing careers. Mm -hmm. It's so what's the cutoff? I mean, how there isn't one. <laughs> so you can be 49, 50, and 
possibly become a police officer at that age? Absolutely, and we've had it happen. Wow. Um, you know, there's an, uh, a, the age limit begins and ends at 20 and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, it's really all about one's capacity and capability and desire and then, you know, stick to in order to get through, you know, what essentially is a very um, rigorous process. Right. We have a caller, Lisa. What's your question? Hi there. Hi, Lisa. I love that Santa Monica is such a bike-friendly city, but I feel like a lot of cyclists ride really dangerously. Can you give us some safety tips as far as how to get around them for both bikers and those who are driving, please? Okay, well, thank you. And it's a great question. Yes, yeah, Santa Monica is very bicycle friendly. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, clearly designated bicycle lanes. Uh, they are painted vividly green in some areas of the city. In some other areas of the city, you'll see what's called a sharo. And a sharo means that in that particular area, uh, the bicycles share the road equally in the center of the road as do um, the motorists. Uh, I've, I always tell people exercise caution with respect to that because people are still getting used to what that is because that's not something that's present in every city. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's that. Then we have a recently uh, enacted uh, state law that says you have to give three feet between the edge of your car and bicyclists, and it's always wise if bicyclists, you know, obey the rules of the road. The same rules apply to bicyclists as to motorists in the sense that um, you know a red light is a red light and a stop sign is a stop sign and hand signals are always a good thing um, and then certainly lights at night uh, and reflectorized clothing uh, the state law requires that a bicycle be equipped with lighting a lighting system uh, it's wise to wear reflectorized clothing um, and then you know to always watch if you if you don't make eye contact with someone who's coming toward you You should always wait. I mean, it's kind of like that way that we were instructed when we we're learning how to cross the street Stop look and listen um, Look both ways before you cross things like that stop for the red light stop for the stop signs It's safe. To, it's best to wear a bicycle helmet and to wear protective gear and obey the rules of the road right. So bicyclists can be ticketed absolutely if they're if they're not driving carefully or if they kind of feel like they always have the right of way because sometimes I feel like it's it's a battle between the motorists and the bicyclists but are you're ticketing them as well yes we are <laughs> and and we're, we're ticketing because of the educational component right um, anytime you're talking about motor vehicle enforcement whether you're talking about bicycle enforcement whether you're talking about pedestrian safety we're out there in order to bring s the, the message of safety to everyone's attention. So it becomes important for us to use citations as a way of behavioral correction, but also it allows uh, people to, under, you know, to understand that, yes, we are out here, we do take this serious because we know that there's lots of bicycles, we know that there's traffic congestion, we know that there's lots of cars, we know that there's lots of pedestrians, and then we know that there's those distractions in everyone's life that happens inside the car, inside our heads, and sometimes terrible things happen and we want everyone to be aware of their obligations to responsibly utilize the road. So tell us about the police officers on bicycles mm -hmm. and why is that, is that unique to Santa Monica? No, I wish it, there was a time when I would say yes, but anymore, no. Mm -hmm. uh, you find bicycles, um, officers on bicycles all over. It's a way to, um, differently engage our community because mm -hmm. people in the community love seeing the officers on the bicycles. It's a great way for them to maintain a level of fitness while working. Uh, it's also a very stealth and quick way for us to be able to respond in smaller geographic areas, but increasingly um, larger areas for our, our city. So you, we'll be down on the beach on bicycles, on 3rd Street, downtown on bicycles, and in other areas in, on bicycles as well. Right. Yeah, they're very friendly when I've <laughs> approached the bikes on cops. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a break, so uh, if you have any other questions, please call 310-458-4950, 310-458-4950. We'll be right back and ready to take your call, so please call. And we also want to ask you guys to ask the chief at hashtag ask the chief. If you have any questions, tweet your questions. You don't have to call in if you're feeling a little shy. Uh, hashtag ask the chief. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
the Santa Monica Museum of Art. Take a closer look. Riding a bicycle can seem like child's play. But only if you're playing indoors. and bikes need to play together. Play it safe. Ride by the rules. Hey, share the road. Who knows what gratitude means? Nicholas? To be thankful. Writing letters to our military is a great way to say thank you for their service. Frisco! Somebody loves you. Dear soldier, Thank you for keeping me safe. You're my hero. To donate or send a care package to America's Heroes, visit OperationGratitude.com. I thought I had everything under control. Then, one day, something happened. I didn't know how to stop it. I didn't know there was help. Until someone told me. Providing access to justice, the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles can help with domestic violence issues, eviction defense, government benefits, immigration, and other civil legal issues. Welcome back to Ask the Chief. I'm Naiva Reynoso, and today we're talking with Chief Jacqueline Seabrooks, the head of the Santa Monica Police Department. We're asking our questions and inviting you to join the conversation by calling 310-458-4950. So call 310-458-4950 if you have a burning question for <laughs> Chief Seabrooks. <laughs> Now's the time. I, I wanted to ask you, there's a lot of uh, police officers that work in different departments. Typically, we, we tend to think that they're all, you know, they're all just in patrol cars. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of different things that they could do, so, mm -hmm. and that they do do. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the structure of the police department. Well, the structure of the police department is um, hierarchical. That means that the boss is at the top, although I always say it's an inverted pyramid. I'm kind of at the bottom, and <laughs> everything just kind of weighs on my shoulders. But all things being equal, um, we have an array of different assignments from even within the patrol setting. So an officer can ride um, in a car, he or she can ride a police motorcycle, they can be on an assignment where they have to ride a bicycle, mm -hmm. uh, they can then move, or they can also be in an assignment where they train new police officers, um, then we call that a field training officer. Um, and then there's detectives, and within detectives are an array of different assignments and duties to include robbery homicide, vice narcotics, which is undercover work, um, uh, sex crimes, economic crimes, uh, technology crimes, I mean, you name it, there's, there's a detective that will specialize in that particular area. And then we have uh, different layers for our supervisors with respect to, well, let me back up. We also have background investigators who handle uh, the uh, background screening for our uh, new candidates to the police department. We have policy development because that's an integral part of what we do. Um, so there's, there's an array of things there. And then we have people who uh, tr are uh, drill instructors at the police academy, so that's a really important position because they're also shaping the future of law enforcement on a county-wide level because uh, every agency in the county utilizes the same uh, or a similar police academy format. Right. So we have those things. And then as, as an officer promotes through to police sergeant, which is a supervisory rank, uh, there's even more opportunities, uh, opportunities to serve in audits, planning, inspections, um, internal affairs, um, the, p the public information officer who is my executive officer. There's an array of different things and that even translates as you move to police lieutenant and to police captain. There's, there's a bit less diversity, more responsibility, but there's all these opportunities. And then we're constantly on uh, the lookout for uh, additional things that we can do and how we can uh, increase our value add to the community by expanding the internal services that we provide, and those services are provided by folks in the police organization. And that's just on the sworn side of the house. Wow. Then we have civilians in the police department who are not police officers, but do essential functions, uh, such as uh, staff and uh, oversee the operation of our jail, uh, staff and oversee the function of our evidence and property room, uh, our records management, our technology acquisitions, 
uh, emergency communications, police and fire uh, dispatch. There's all kinds of employment opportunities in the organization. So we always tell people whether you're interested in being a CSI, a police officer, uh, an, uh, a staff member who takes police reports in the field, someone who's directing traffic and doing parking citation, issuing parking citations. There's an array of career opportunities within a police department. We're a small business. And it's so wonderful to have a female as a role model in the police department as the chief. That's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about uh, what message can you get to, to women out there that may feel a little intimidated uh, to possibly go into the field and are interested in the field? Well, the first piece of advice I would give is um, try it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I, and I get the, the intimidation factor. It's I'm going to be working around a bunch of men, I'm going to be doing all of these things. But sometimes those are the tapes that play in our head. Um, because the, the profession needs more women. Um, we bring a different way of doing business uh, to the job. Uh, certainly no, no less valuable, just different. Right. Um, and with that comes wonderful opportunities. I mean, I look at my, my career that spans you know, more than three decades and I've met three different presidents um, as we were preparing for uh, their visits to our community. Um, we, I sat in attendance at the funeral of, of President Reagan. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many opportunities that, you know, growing up in, in South Central Los Angeles, who would have known? Uh, I wouldn't have known that back then I would be here now, you know, overseeing an $83 million enterprise that is charged with providing the most important service, in my opinion, that a community can provide to the men and women who reside, visit, own businesses in, in a small geographic space. Definitely. And it's, it's really cool, and then it doesn't hurt to be a girl, and <laughs> you know, it's fun. <laughs> but, but, but in that, though, you know, is, is um, really a, a window of opportunity. And young people, young women in particular, uh, people of color in particular, need to recognize that change begins when you say yes. Right, thank you, that's, that's amazing. And you are a, a fabulous role model for all the women out there. Thanks. Plus you have some cool pink uh, <laughs> stilettos on. <laughs> Well, you know, even in all of this, while I wear a <laughs> uniform and, and I tend, you know, I was telling someone today, you know, I, I, I tend toward the conservative. There are those momentary flares that even I have that I have to give in. Of and, course. you know, a conservative black suit, hot pink shoes. Of course. <laughs> 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 Police chiefing 101 right. when you're a woman. Right. And we have Ava with the, with, the co with the question. Ava? Hi, how are you? Hi, Ava. So uh, I, I had a question because last week my car got broken into and I didn't know if I should call 911 or if I should just call uh, the police station. How do I know when to call which? Okay. Well, Ava, you call 911 when there's a life-threatening emergency um, either for you or for someone else. So for example, if you were sitting in the car and someone threw a brick through the window and was telling you to get out of the car, and you, you had your telephone pre-programmed, so all you had to do is push one button for 911, that would be the time to call 911. Um, on the other hand, if you were in your home and you parked your car at 10 o'clock at night, and then when you came out to go to work the next morning at 7, you found that uh, your, windshield, your, your window or glass was broken and someone had taken your things, that's when you would call the general business number and ask that an officer uh, come out and take a report or depending on if, the, if there's not one available, they may ask you to come to the police department uh, to uh, have the report uh, taken and also to, to um, uh, dust your vehicle for f uh, potential fingerprint evidence, forensic evidence. Thank you so much for your call. And maybe neighborhood watch programs can, can help and, and provide assistance for when they see burglaries such as this. Tell us about that program, neighborhood okay. watch programs in Santa Monica. Okay, well there's, there's two types of neighborhood watch programs that occur in Santa Monica. There's the more traditional neighborhood watch which is uh, facilitated meetings that uh, our staff from our community affairs section uh, in conjunction with our neighborhood resource officers uh, put together and take out in the community. Mm -hmm. And then the second layer of that is called uh, next door.com and it's a, a virtual neighborhood watch where neighbors uh, communicate with each other about the the comings and goings in the neighborhood using um, it's it's almost like email a and yet you know the police department isn't 
uh, privy to all of the exchanges, but what happens is if neighbors start seeing similar patterns, someone in the group usually will say, you know, we need to tell this to the police. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we receive that information so that we can then act upon it. Um, where I live, I'm a member of, of nextdoor.com, and, and it's interesting the dialogues that occur about, you know, s traffic calming measures, about um, scams that may be happening in the neighborhood, um, right. and, and, and folks' insight about, you know, we need to call the police about this, oh no, we don't want to bother the police about that, and then, you know, every now and then I send something out as the voice of reason that says, you know, the police need to know about that. And I'm glad that you brought up Nextdoor because everyone mm -hmm. is using apps nowadays on their yes. phones. And I actually have the Nextdoor app and it's been very helpful um, just to getting to know your neighbors, yes. getting familiar with your neighbors. So this app is vetted by the police. I mean, you guys, mm -hmm. you guys back it up. Yes. Wow. I think it's it, anything that gets people want to know their neighbors because mm -hmm. in this day and age, we're all busy. Right. Uh, we all have varying schedules and we don't always see our neighbors. And there's this tendency when one lives in a, in a metropolitan area, even though we like to say that, you know, Los Angeles is a suburb of Santa Monica, <laughs> all things being equal, we still, you know, we don't always know who our neighbors are. I mean, I've lived in my community for 11 years, and I know some of, I know my immediate neighbors, but the folks who live, you know, a block or two over, I don't necessarily know them. Right. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to create that sense of community in a virtual way, and we support anything that does that appropriately. Right. And, and nextdoor.com is one of those. And it's amazing that you're also able to put a message out there. Yes, indeed. Through the app. Yes. Now we don't, but the members You're of Nextdoor do, because that's one of the um, the operating rules of it is that it's not meant to take take the place of a communication with a police department. It's meant to facilitate communication amongst the neighbors in a, in a particular area. Right. Um, and then what happens is, you know, we talk with the neighbors through more traditional means so that we don't lose that connection. Right. So it's Nextdoor. Dot com. Dot com. It's a free app. And on, and on Apple, iTunes. On <laughs> Apple. <laughs> I have it. I love it. I've actually used it. Uh, you can actually swap tools with neighbors, mm -hmm. too, if, you're, if you need an extra wrench. <laughs> uh, so it's very useful for this many is. different reasons. It's Summertime is approaching. Mm -hmm. This year has flown by, right? Yes. Who knew uh, we're already halfway through? Right, and a lot of people are going to be going on vacation. What are mm -hmm. some safety tips that you can give us so they can kind of uh, you know, have their house a little safer and mm -hmm. feel like they're doing all the necessary precautions? Okay, well the first thing I, I often encourage people to do when they know they're going to uh, be leaving is to um, harden the target of the residents against uh, the coincidental criminal. Um, and what that means is don't leave windows, um, you know, ajar even slightly. You know, we all, even, and this is, this holds true even if you're just running down to the market because we always say, oh, I'm only going to be gone a half an hour. And a half an hour is never a half an hour. Um, so, you know, the, the idea is, number one, lock all your doors and windows. Um, I would suggest putting lights, some lights strategically around the home on different timers mm -hmm. so it appears as though lights are coming on at different times. Uh, let your neighbors know or someone, you know, trusted know so they can come by and get all the mail, the junk mail that the, the post, post, person tends to jam in the mailbox and, and it falls all on the, on the floor, make sure someone comes and picks that up um, so that it doesn't look like your home is, is, is empty or, or people are away. Uh, if you have friends uh, who can come by and check on the property, that's a good thing. And then last but not least, you can always request a vacation check from the, your local police department. Since I'm speaking on behalf of Santa Monica, you can always ask for what we call a periodic check for the period of time that you're away, provided you're not going to be away for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're only going to be away, you know, five, ten days, ask us to come by and we'll come by and we can always leave a notice card in the in the internal slot in a mailbox so it doesn't, you know, bulk up, letting you know that we came by and checked on the property and to the degree that we, we can, we know that, you know, it looked okay. Right, so what does a visit such as this typically happen? Like, wh what does it look like? They, they walk around the property, mm -hmm. they make sure that there's no windows that have been broken? Well, anything, no obvious signs of, of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that way, um, you know, we just, we, we have a sense, oh, you know, there may be a, a vacant, not vacant, but someone's not here to be attentive to what's going on. So it's really just to walk around, be a presence, kind of keep an eye. We can't guarantee that nothing will happen. We can't, we won't know if something has happened necessarily. But I mean, right. if, if we were there yesterday and everything was fine and we're there again today and now, you know, the front door's kicked in, it's less likely that it'll go, you know, for the duration of a vacation, we can go in and, and, and perhaps make a contact with somebody uh, to come in and, 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 you know, board it up or something like that. 
And do you suggest house alarms or? Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, I think anything that uh, individual residents uh, or apartment owners can engage in that is self-protective is a good thing. I mean, right. even on my own home, I have an alarm, I have uh, a camera system, uh, I have a loud big dog. Um, you know, because while I, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not fearful that my house is going to be burglarized or I'm going to be robbed in my home, it's all preventative. And equally, if something does happen, it ensures that there's evidence uh, that we might be able to utilize that will help to apprehend the person responsible. What can you tell us about knock-knock burglaries? Oh, knock-knock burglaries. For those that don't know what a knock-knock burglary is, what is a knock-knock burglary? A knock-knock burglary is one of those uh, particular uh, scams that occurs where someone will come up, knock on the door, and, and, and just to, to see if someone is home, or if you come to the door, they'll say, oh, I'm looking for, and they'll just make up a name. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to be careful about opening the door to strangers and people that you don't know or you weren't expecting. Um, and then secondarily, if there's no uh, answer, what the person or, or uh, an accomplice of theirs may do is uh, go around the back, look for an open door, look for an open window. Uh, if it's ac reasonably accessible, go through a doggy door, mm -hmm. potentially you know, gain access to the property in some way to go in inside, steal items, and then leave. And, and you'd be surprised. It doesn't take a long time, and people typically are not stealing 80-inch TVs. Right. So should you report to that to the police if someone knocks on your door with suspicious behavior, you suspect it is a potential a knock knock burglary should you call the police and say i just got a weird guy he knocked on my door he was asking for a name that uh, someone that doesn't live here mm -hmm. do you report that yes you do and now you don't call as as in the earlier call you don't mm -hmm. call 911 for that mm -hmm. unless the person's actively breaking in and you're in the residence that's one of those things that constitutes a potentially life threatening um, emergency because if that person breaks in and you're in the home you don't know what they're going to do so right. Notwithstanding that, um, you know, you see this person, they're knocking on your neighbor's doors, uh, they've now knocked on your door, maybe they're looking in, in, the, in the windows, they're looking in the side yards, things like that, yes. Call uh, the business line, and for the Santa Monica Police Department, that would be 310-458-8491. Uh, that's our um, police and fire uh, communication center. Uh, tell them that you, you see suspicious activity, you think it might be someone who is, is um, a burglar or, or is looking to commit a burglary, and you provide a description, uh, which includes uh, the clothing that the person is wearing, their gender, uh, their race, if you, if you can determine that, uh, the direction of travel that you last saw them in, whether or not they might have been in a vehicle. Uh, you know, you get as much information as you can. The operator will ask for those questions because when that information is provided to the responding police officers, they will be looking for people based on the description that's provided. And more information is better. Right, and this is uh, information that you can also post on Nextdoor. Absolutely, on the app. absolutely. And kind of uh, alert your neighbors that there's this weird guy or girl, whatever, Yes, that's uh, knocking on doors and asking for people that don't live there. Absolutely. In fact, to your point, I was reading next door the other day in my own community, and that's exactly what they were talking about, mm -hmm. that people were walking around, knocking on the door, and someone was walking up someone's driveway, and one of the neighbors went out and, and confronted that individual. Now, I would exercise, I would tell them, exercise exceed extreme caution in making decisions to uh, confront someone. That's the police department's job. Call the police department. And I know there is a tendency for folks to say, oh, they're too busy. I, what if I'm making a mistake? What have you. Right. Call us. We will be the determiners as to whether or not, you know, we'll prioritize the call. Uh, secondarily, we'll, we'll be the determiner as to whether or not this person uh, has a legitimate explanation for what they've done. And uh, if you want to be contacted, let the operator know that, and we'll reach back to you and let you know what we, d what we found or didn't find. Another big draw to Santa Monica is the Twilight concert series. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> um, if people are, are going to go out there and have fun, you know, it's, it's a little bit later at night. Sometimes mm -hmm. people get intoxicated. Tell mm. us some safety measures to prevent any type of incident. Well, I wish I could tell you um, safety measures to pr protect from any type of incident. But mm -hmm. I'll, let's, let's focus on the big ones. There's no drinking on the beach. Uh, there's no bringing of alcohol or bottles onto the beach, so people shouldn't be drinking, um, but I know better. So <laughs> with that in mind, if you're going to be drinking, don't drive, and if you're going to be driving, don't drink. So those, now that we've got those out of the way, 
Um, then come to the beach, have a good time. The musical selections are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, ambiance is great. I mean, what better place to be than on the pier, on the beach, hearing great music and taking in all the sights and sounds in a careful, responsible manner that isn't over imbibing uh, in anything, whether right. it's alcohol, alcoholic beverages, or other smokables, <laughs> which are a no-no on the beach. But I'm sure you deploy a lot of officers for that you know, I'm sure they're they're all volunteering <laughs> that they want to go cover that <laughs> event, right? <laughs> well, you know, we've done some things differently with the deployment of folks on the um, for the Twilight concert series. Um, I've been back with the city now uh, for three three years, mm -hmm. and when I first the first year I was back, I was watching you know certain things to see how things had changed during the five years I'd been gone. And one of the things I was surprised at was to see that you know we needed to beef up our deployments on the beach because the crowds were intense. Um, I mean, we had a few events where there were you know, 30,000 people on the beach, but we didn't have near enough uh, officers, in my opinion, to be able to safely uh, address any issues that arose. So we engaged a contract with the Sheriff's Department and now in addition to beefing up our staffing, uh, we also have the assistance of the Sheriff's Department should we need it, and the events are rolling along and people feel safe and I'm happy as a clam. Talk to us about joint staffing. Okay, now when you say joint staffing, you mean joint staffing Sorry, with Sorry, joint dis dispatch. Uh, okay, <laughs> joint dispatch. Well, uh, about 18 months or so ago, mm -hmm. uh, we realized that we were operating redundant systems with mm -hmm. a separate police communication dispatch center and a separate uh, police, uh, or excuse me, uh, communication center for the fire department. Okay. So we embarked on the journey of consolidating uh, and the, the two functions and eliminating redundancies because we knew that in the end, what that would do is that would represent uh, a significant uh, time savings for citizens, an ability for us to uh, enhance our response times on both sides of that public safety continuum, and it would be a seamless transition for our staff, the f fire department staff, in terms of the end receiver, the, the officer or uh, fire uh, engine paramedic unit that's, that's responding. Right. Uh, it, it allowed us to uh, jointly train or team train our personnel, and that actually acts as, as a force multiplier. So we get an economy of scale, and it's working very well. It's right. working very well. Our police dispatchers are learning a new discipline. Our fire dispatchers are learning a new discipline, and together we're able to do much more from the same room for less money, more efficiently, and more effectively. Right. Good business decision. That chief is something else. <laughs> <laughs> Very efficient, for sure. <laughs> so tell us about uh, pedestrian safety, because we know the city of Santa Monica, mm -hmm. everyone loves to walk around here mm -hmm. and enjoy nature, enjoy the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a, a, a special training, or, or what kind of things can you tell us about pedestrian safety? Well, I'll tell you that pedestrian safety is a major priority for Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. As a walkable city, we also have a companion obligation to ensure, <coughs> pardon me, that uh, people who are walking through our community can do so in a safe manner. And that goes back to some of the conversation earlier about uh, the need for us to engage in enforcement and education so that we um, can place safety first and foremost in people's minds. Right. So while we engage in enforcement against the errant pedestrian who jaywalks uh, and things like that, we also push for pedestrian safety from the motorist standpoint. Uh, we emphasize uh, enforcement of those violations that are what we call right-of-way violations as those relate to pedestrians, i.e. the person who zips through the crosswalk, who fails to stop for pedestrians in crosswalks, passes vehicles that are stopped on the right, uh, you know, and, and we've all seen those kinds of things happen. So we conduct pedestrian stings uh, to bring a level of awareness uh, regarding this need for pedestrian safety, even as we work with the city to identify mechanisms and measures to enhance the pedestrian experience through you know, different engineering. Mm. Uh, we work with the state's uh, Office of Traffic Safety. We get grant money to help us to put forth uh, education programs, which are gonna be even more important as rail returns to Santa Monica after more than 50 years. Uh, because with a train passing by uh, at grade level uh, in a lot of areas, it's gonna be important that our young people as well as our seniors are educated about uh, train safety as it relates to them being pedestrians. Definitely. We only have one more minute left, so okay. before we wrap it up, is there anything new and exciting that's coming out of the Santa Monica Police Department that we should know about? 
Well, we're going through uh, some significant changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at a new deployment plan that will affect uh, staffing in our downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going through uh, a significant growth and transition as an organization, and a whole lot of new faces will be uh, wearing sergeant stripes, lieutenant bars, and over time, even captain bars. So we're going through some internal promotions. I mean, it's a wonderful wow. time to be in Santa Monica, and it's a wonderful time to be uh, part of the Santa Monica Police Department, and we're out there doing all we can to crush crime and keep this town safe. Tough chief. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, pink shoes. <laughs> I, with pink stilettos. <laughs> now that's a chief. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I, we won't. We'll keep it a secret. But that's all the time we have for you tonight. Thank you for tuning in and calling in to Ask the Chief. And thank you, Chief Seabrooks. It was so much fun. We have mm -hmm. to do it again. Yes, we must. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Naiba Reynoso. Thanks for watching City TV.